All right, we're in a different place. We're normally preaching through the book of Romans, because, but because it's Father's Day, um, I thought of something Father's Day related, uh, or father related, and so if you would, go back to where we read this morning, Joshua chapter 7, Joshua chapter 7, and we'll pray, once you find your place, we'll pray, and um, we will get started. Joshua chapter 7, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. Alright, so the first book after the Pentateuch. Joshua chapter 7. Stay with me today because we're going to look at two men and how great an influence they can have on us for good and for bad. So Joshua chapter 7, uh, we'll pray and we'll get right into this. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open your Bible. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful book. Lord, you used it to change my life and you've used it to change others' lives in this room. And Lord, there's no other book like it. It's a living book. It's a powerful book. Yet sadly, in our day, Lord, we know that this world is sleepy, zombie-like, and they don't realize the power of the book that's been on their shelves covering, covered with dust. Lord, one day this book will be opened and will be judged out of this book and out of other books. And Lord, then it will matter to many, but it won't, it will be too late. So Lord, help us to treasure this book that's in our laps. Lord, uh, you know us. We get carnal and we get to the point where we don't allow the power of this book to permeate our lives. So Lord, I pray that it would not be so in the case of myself, and in everyone here. Lord, we need your word to guide us. We need your word to protect us from the ills of our flesh in this world. So Lord, please do what only you can do today. We love you, Father. We love you, your Son. And we love you, your Holy Spirit, for you're the agent that uh, brings all this to our hearts and minds and helps us to understand. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I almost said you can be seated. You're already seated. All right. Have you ever heard, heard the phrase being comfortable in your own skin. Have you ever heard that phrase? You know, we may look at ourselves, look at ourselves in the mirror, and we may feel pretty confident in who we are. Maybe it's our looks. Yeah, pretty good looking person. I know Matt, he always says that he's number one good looking guy around. But, um, <laughs> but um, maybe it's our looks. Maybe it's our build. Maybe it's our intelligence, our character what we've accomplished. Maybe it's our financial status. But then, this happens to me. Like I said, I don't think I'm topping all those things, but, but sometimes that feeling comes over us. Pride. Not all uh, self-respect is not bad, but sometimes we have these feelings, and then we meet someone, and really quick we realize, I guess I wasn't all that I thought I was. Sometimes I can think, well, I, I'm a, a good servant of God, and then I meet some people that are light years ahead of me. But just when we think we are doing okay, we may meet someone who, again, is light years ahead of us. Maybe they've made wiser decisions. They have accomplished a lot for God. And suddenly we feel cast down. Has that ever happened to you? There's times when I think with myself, I think I'm doing pretty good, and then I meet someone and I'm like, man, Lord, they've worked so much harder than me. They've done so much more than me. But what does the Bible say about this? 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. When you feel like comparing yourself to someone, feeling you're better, you know what you're doing? You're using your own self as a measuring stick. And when you feel cast down because you're not as good as somebody else, um, you're using that same measuring stick. The Bible says it's not wise to measure this way. Warren Wearsby calls this group the Mutual Admiration Society. They're the people that look amongst each other to, to get their bearing. But verse 18 in that same chapter says, For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. So a better way for us to look at ourselves is look at how God looks at us. So the problem is using ourselves or looking to others to receive some kind of comfort concerning ourselves. 
Ultimately, it's what God says about you and I that matters. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. So, but I ask you here, does this not mean, does this mean now that we should never compare and contrast things? Yes, we should do comparisons and contrasts. All of us make regular decisions comparing and contrasting things. Hey, is this the right decision? Is this the right person to be with? Comparing and contrasting is not a bad thing. In fact, God does it all the time. Does God do this? Yes. Here's a couple examples, and I think this will spur your thinking. Proverbs 13.1, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. God is in the business of comparing and contrasting things that are good and bad. Here's another one. Proverbs, let's see, Proverbs 10 and verse 1. A wise son maketh the glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Those are things that we should think about. Men, do you live, lead such a life that it makes your mom sad? Some of your moms may not be here. But while they were, you were in this life, did, was your mom heavy over your life? Was your father glad over your life? Proverbs 22.3 says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. So God does do comparisons. He talks to people about, you know, which way are you going to go? Are you going to go this way or are you going to go that way? So God lays out comparisons and contrast to warn us and to help us. He does not want to see us destroy our lives by bad decisions. How many of you can name dozens of people you know that have made horrible decisions in their lives because they didn't follow God? Can you raise your hand? I'm sure you can. We can all think of some. We can say that about ourselves, too. So on this Father's Day, I'd like us to use God's Word and compare and contrast two fathers, asking ourselves this question, and this is my title, which father am I? Which father am I? We're going to look at God's Word and compare and contrast a couple of guys. Well, you may say, wait a minute, you just said it's not wise to compare ourselves. Um, God says that we should. God gives us examples. What we should not do is use our own measuring stick, making ourselves feel good about ourselves based upon our own uh, qualifications. That's not wise. Now, you ladies may say, whew, I'm off the hook. It's Father's Day. I can just check out. Don't check out. And I, obviously, I don't think that's the normal case with the ladies. It's usually the guys maybe that check out. But guys don't check out. Ladies don't check out. Both of, think of this. As we look at these men's lives, both of them have lives. We're going to look at one man. And I want you to think, as we're talking about the first man, think about what his wife may have been like. And then for the other man, think about the way his, his wife may have been like. Ladies, you can encourage or you can discourage, you can lift up your husband, or you can drag him down. You know, Eve, thank God that Adam and Eve are both forgiven. By the way, you know, there's people that don't believe Adam and Eve are in heaven. Um, I think that's kind of crazy. They, they got right with God very quickly. But, but Eve, the Bible says, was in the transgression. Adam was responsible, but Eve influenced him greatly to take that fruit, and it damaged the whole world. But in this day, in this example today, I bet the wives could have played a part. So as we think of these two men, consider, you ladies, consider their wives. So here's my outline. Number one, we have our comparison and contrast. We have a comparison and contrast to look at. God gives us two men to think about. And please ask yourself, men, which one of these do I represent as a father? If you're not a father yet... Decide which father you will be. That's a decision. If you make it now, you have a way better chance of being a good dad later. If you're not a man, don't dismiss this. But consider, what kind of woman can I be? If you're a young person, you have the opportunity to choose who you will be. You literally are writing the story of your life. You're co-authoring it with God. If you decide, I do not want God as a co-author, you're going to write the story of your life. And it's not going to be the story that you will be happy with in the end. If you will allow God to be your co-author, you're going to have a good life. So, if you're a young person, you have the opportunity to choose what kind of life you're going to live. And it's never, by the way, if you're older, it's never too late to get off the wrong path and onto a right one. Many people in the Bible changed, turned their life over to God, and God is able to restore the years that the canker worm have eaten, the Bible says. So if you're in Joshua chapter 7, let's begin. In Joshua chapter 6, you know the story. They came to the, they crossed over the Jordan. They came to Jericho. 
That was their first city they were going to face. And it was a huge victory. All right? So they had a mighty victory. The walls of the city miraculously fell flat, and God's people had conquered their first city in the Promised Land. And as God was behind them, just as he said, it happened. But now, everything has come screeching to a halt. If there were tire marks, if there were pavement, you'd have heard, Rrr, bam, because it was a complete stop. Everything had come screeching to a halt. So they had this great victory in chapter 6. Look at verse 1 of chapter 7. Verse 1, and we're going to read that. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So the first man we'll look at is this man, Achan. Achan. In considering him, let's first consider Achan's actions. In our comparison and contrast, we're looking at the man, A Achan. And we're going to look at Aha Achan's actions. Wow. I, I tried to alliterate, and that got tongue tied Achan's actions. Okay. So who was this man? Achan was a man from the tribe of Judah. What does his name mean? Some of you may know this if you're uh, well-versed in the Bible. What does the name Achan mean? Does anyone know? Okay, that's okay. I'll, that'll give me the chance to tell you. All right, but God uses names in his word. We get taught a lot through names. The name Achan means to trouble or troublesome. He was a troublesome person. How did he get that name? Was he a load of trouble from the beginning? Maybe his, I'm, this is complete speculation, maybe he had a trouble, deliver, his mom had a trouble delivery, I don't know. But he was a load of trouble from the beginning. Was he a mischievous little boy? We do not know. But here's the, one of the things I want you to catch. Sadly, he never got past what his name meant. He fulfilled what his name meant. Troubler, troublesome. He fulfilled his name. If you have a name that doesn't mean something good, don't fulfill that name. Fulfill what you could be. All right? So he stayed in that place. He never got past what his name meant. So let's look now at Achan's actions. In verse 1, after this great triumph, Israel hits a wall. The nation had committed a trespass. What is a trespass? Does anyone want to join in? What is a trespass? I'm sorry? A sin, yes. Uh, here's my definition I got from Webster's 1828. By the way, if you want a good dictionary, Webster's 1828 has a lot of biblical uh, uh, definitions. But Webster's 1828 tells us that this word means treachery. And the word treachery means a cover-up, something done covertly. All right? So it means falsehood, a grievously sore trespass. So the nation of Israel committed treachery against the Lord. So Israel, the scripture says Israel committed the trespass, but we'll find it was Achan. But God charged the people as a whole. Take, uh, take applications from these and principles. Achan was the one that sinned, but God charged the nation of Israel. We'll find it was Achan, of course. But watch out, your sin does not affect just you. What you do in secret, God sees. You may say, well, it's not my fault. I mean, it, I, I sin this thing, but it's not going to affect people around me. It's absolutely not true. The way you live will affect those around you. You have children, you have grandchildren, you have people around you. Your testimony will affect them. So, what you do in secret, God sees. The Bible says it was a trespass in what? What's the word? A there, can you, towards the end of the verse. Ju uh, Achan took of the what? A cursed thing. It says he took something accursed. When he did this, what did it do? When he did this, it kindled the fire of God's anger. It started a blaze in God's heart. I want you to know something, that what you do, your actions of your heart and your mind, not only affect the people that are around you, but it affects God. You may say, me? I'm nobody. What you do affects God. And what Achan did kindled the anger of God. It got him fiercely angry. I hope you understand that when you do things, it does affect God. It affects how he feels. 
How do we make God feel with our heart and our affections? You may say, it doesn't matter. God's holy. He's up there in heaven. I don't affect Him. That is not true. That is proves how loving God is. Our deeds, our actions can anger Him. They can please Him. So as we read the Scriptures, let the Scriptures be alive and powerful. They're not just words on a page, as I say often. How do we make God feel with our heart and actions? The Bible says in this verse, God was angry with the whole nation regarding Achan's actions. You can do a sin that could affect a country. In this case, it definitely did. But what was the accursed thing? Turn back to chapter 6. What was the accursed thing? We're going to read verses 17 through 19. Verse 17 through 19 of chapter 6. And the city shall be accursed. So when they went into, they were commanded, when they went to Jericho, the whole city was to be accursed. Okay? There was directions from God on how they were supposed to handle things when they got into Jericho, when they climbed the walls that fell. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she went... I'm sorry, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse, and trouble it. Funny, the name Achan is coming out in living color. But all the silver, and the gold, and vessels of brass and iron, are consecrated unto the Lord, they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the word accursed means this. This is very powerful. It's good to look up definitions. It is something devoted to religious purposes, especially destruction. So anything that's accursed is something that God has devoted to take care of business with. It's to destroy in this case. It is to destroy it. So the, the word accursed means something devoted to religious purposes, especially destruction. Things that are accursed are wicked and malignant to the extreme. The word malignant is a very powerful, uh, detestable, hated word. So, something consecrated to be utterly destroyed, doomed to destruction or misery. The city was to be accursed, and all that were in it, except for Rahab and her family, because she gave herself to God and helped Israel. And God told them ahead of time to keep themselves from the accursed thing, so that they themselves would not become accursed. The gold, silver, brass, and iron was consecrated to God first. It was a first fruit offering to God. It belonged to God. Do we understand that when we love something that God hates, that will take us down the wrong road? I challenge you men and everyone here, when we love what's of the flesh, when we love something that God detests, we are putting ourselves on a collision course with God. And that's not what God wants. He warned them ahead of time. When we love what He hates, guarantee it will take you down the wrong road. You cannot serve two masters. You can either love the one or hate the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, that money, that things of this world. So things that God deemed detestable. God was a, He thought this search, He planned that this city and everything in it except for Rahab, and then the, the spoils went to God. God detested that. What God deemed detestable, Achan felt like they were worthy of keeping. Have you thought about that? What God hated, Achan saw, hey, this is good. This is good for me to take, for me and my family. So, let's see now what happened by his actions. And I ask you here, do we love the things that God faithfully warns us about? God loves us and He warns us about things that we shouldn't do for our own sake, for our children's sake. Do we love those things that He warns us about? That's a dangerous thing. Call upon God. Say, Lord, you know the things I struggle with. I should not love what you hate. Turn to God. He'll give you grace. But if you decide, I don't care. I could care less. I'm going to love what my flesh wants. You may laugh now, but you will not laugh later. The Bible says in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, God is not mocked. See, God is mocked in this world, but the real truth is God is not mocked because all the mockery that's going to happen will come to fruition and they'll pay for it. God is not mocked. Uh, now I'm going to lose the verse. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. God gives us a warning. God's not going to be mocked. The way you live your life, you may get away with it now, but one day you're going to be straightened up and you're going to go, I wish, I wish, I wish I never lived that life. Same thing with a believer. God is not mocked. Remember that. So, what happened now by his actions? We're going to read verses 2 through 11. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So they had a great victory. God was with them, and they went to this small town. They said, We don't need everybody. Let's just go with them. Two or three thousand men, it'll be no problem. Verse 4, So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So a great defeat after this great victory. And watch Joshua's attitude. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan? to deliver us unto the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. All of them are discouraged now. Verse 8, O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And watch what the Lord says. Verse 10, and, jo and the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Get up, this is not what you think it is. That's where we're at now. Joshua did not know what was happening. God opened his eyes to the problem. He literally told him, Get up, this is not a time for prayer. Does that make sense? It, like, you think, when is it not a time to pray? This was not a time to pray, this was a time to obey. By Achan's actions, 36 men lost their lives. 36 families were grieving now after a great victory. Our decisions do matter. They were way more powerful than Ai, but without God, they were easily defeated. His decision caused the people's hearts to melt. Achan did not listen. We'll talk about that in a moment, but think about this. Their decision caused these 36 men to die. Without God, they are easily defeated. If you decide, I don't need God, I'm pretty self-sufficient. That's a foolish thought. You have power when you're humble with God. When you're self-sufficient, God steps back maybe a little bit from your life. So they were way more powerful than Ai, but they were defeated. Now think about, I want us to consider who this man is. He was raised in this nation. He heard the commands of God. He knew the truth. There are many men that hear the truths of the word of God. They re they've read their Bibles. They've been raised religious. But they could be like Achan. Achan was dull of hearing. He was not super sensitive, as far as I can see, to the things of God. By Achan's actions, 36 men died. He did not fear God. When the commandment was given, don't touch the accursed thing. If you touch the accursed thing, you're going to be accursed. He heard the commandment, but his heart was somewhere else. This was a serious command. I hope you understand. We are not to touch the things that are devoted to God. Things that belong to God belong to Him. We should have enough reverence to say, God, I'm not going to put my hand on that. Remember the ark? Remember when it was coming back into Jerusalem and Uzzah put his hand on the ark and God immediately killed him? Now, you might think, God wasn't trying to do anything bad. The, the ark was shaking. He was trying to steady it. But he was not supposed to touch that. And they weren't even supposed to carry it the way they were carrying it. They were supposed to carry it with staves on the shoulders. And they followed the custom of the Philistines, how it was sent back in. Um, we may, David was upset with God that they called that Perez Uzzah, the breach upon Uzzah. Um, David was not happy that that happened, but guess what? When they brought the ark back in, they did it the right way. God is super merciful to us. How many things does he let us get away with? Lots and lots and lots. But one day God might just say, enough. I'm holy, you should follow me. So it behooves us to listen. So his heart was somewhere else. Um, God promised that those that violated this directive would cause them to be devoted to destruction. Achan's heart and mind was dull of hearing. He didn't take the things seriously. His sin affected the whole nation. In verse 11, 
God attributes the sin to the nation of Israel. Look at verse 12. Their men could not fight in this condition. Uh, actually, we didn't read 11. So 11 and 12. Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Wow. So the whole army was on the road to being accursed unless something was done to fix the situation. God literally told them, I will not be with you anymore unless you take care of business. We must remember, thank God that he doesn't crash upon us like he did in that dispensation. But since it's a time of great mercy, that should not make us callous. We should be careful because God could snuff our light out. We should respect him. So, uh, so God gives them the answer of what to do. Look at verse 13 and 14. He says, Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by household. And the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. So all the people had to set themselves apart. They had to sanctify themselves. They had to separate that day to stand before the Lord to solve the issue. There was no more going to work. There's no more going on a picnic. That was the day that every Israelite had to stand before God. And they knew something bad had happened. And each family had to present themselves before God. You think that was scary? Probably a scary day. We don't have that in our dispensation. We don't have things like that. But one day we will stand before the Lord and give an account of our lives. Not for our sin, if we're saved, but how we lived our lives. So... Now look at the judgment that was promised. Very scary. Look at verse 15. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. It says the man broke a covenant. A covenant is a mutual compact, an agreement between two or more people. God had told them this was the way that they should go, and the people went forward with it. Not only did he break the covenant, he wrought folly in Israel. This word is very interesting. Listen to this. This word folly means weakness of intellect, imbecility. So Achan, God was literally saying, you're an imbecile. You're mentally weak. Okay? That's not God con condemning a man that doesn't have the intelligence that God has. This is God condemning a man who knew better and decided to be ignorant and to be an imbecile for the things that God had commanded. This word folly also means an absurd act which is highly sinful. It also says this, and I found this very interesting, a criminal weakness. It was a weakness in Achan that was criminal. There's things in our lives that we should not allow to be a weakness. We should master them. I'm not talking about becoming perfect. But there's things that we have a criminal weakness that will damage and destroy ourselves, possibly eternally, and our children possibly eternally. How many, my son and I were talking about this last night. How many men in the Bible can you find that raised good children? I was kind of shocked as I thought about it. Many godly men did not raise godly children. Uh, so I challenge you to think about that. Come back to me next week and tell me how many men. I know one man, God said about Abraham, he said, I know that he shall command his children and they will follow me. And I'm sure there are dozens more, okay, hundreds, thousands, whatever. But interestingly enough, there's not that many we can find in the scriptures. What does that tell us? We better wake up to our responsibilities. All right? So uh, now look at what happens next. In Achan's actions, so we're looking at Achan's actions. We're also seeing Achan's appraisal. We are seeing God's assessment on his actions. Look at verses 16 through 18. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarhites, and he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. 
And he brought his household man by man. And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Interesting. In verse 1, we saw that God knew who caused the trouble for Israel. God knew right from verse 1. Why did he take family by family, man by man? Let me ask you that. What's your thoughts? God already knew who the troublemaker was. He could have, you know, forced him out like a tractor beam. He could have pulled him out of his tent and set him right in the midst of Israel. But why did he take every family? Give me a guess. Yeah, see if he would step up. My thought is to put the fear of God in them. Every family had to stand up and present themselves before God, in my opinion, um, but probably a, a, a valid thought. So each tribe was searched. Was it to help everyone have a healthy fear and learn from this event? I guarantee you wanted them to learn from this event. I guarantee you they learned from this event. When you see how it ended, I guarantee it was something they feared. He had to be found out, this man. Moses said, your sin will find you out. Now, Again, we're considering Achan's actions. Isn't it like mankind? Even when 36 men were killed, even when he had opportunity to confess early, he did not. He had the chance. That would have been really hard. If I was the fault of 36 men and their families dying, I wouldn't want to go tell everyone it was my fault. But he had the chance. It's just like mankind. What did he do? He didn't confess early. He did not. Not until he was exposed. How many people will finally admit once they're caught? Pastors that commit adultery, uh, politicians that are, have infidelities, they don't come out and say, I did this. They would look a lot better. You know what they come out? They come out with their lame excuses once they're caught. That's not how you should do it. This is how he did it. We understand why, because this was Achan. He was a troublesome person. He did what he did covertly, behind the scenes. He had to be found out. So he was exposed. I remind you, be transparent with God. You might have done something, you don't have to tell everyone else. But if you're transparent with God about your sin, you can find forgiveness. So, don't, let us be transparent with God. Don't let God have to come and find us and expose you. First off, better not to do the sin at all. But if you do the sin, get clean quick. Because if God has to find you out, He's going to expose you in front of all. Let's see what Achan says. Verse 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. So he's forth right now. And thus and thus have I done. Can you imagine this? What was done in secret is now going to be wide open. God has zeroed in on the problem. Let us remember that God, as I said earlier, is not mocked. What is in the dark will be brought to light. Here's Achan's answers, verse 20 and 21. And Achan answered uh, Joshua, Indeed I have sinned. And then in verse 21, When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. He coveted them. Coveted means to delight in, to lust to earnestly desire, to greatly wish or long for something. One of the Ten Commandments, Achan did not take the laws of God seriously. After all that they went through uh, during the, the, um, the 40 years, and God exacting judgment, somehow Achan was still dull of hearing. Maybe he had the idea, it won't happen to me. It won't happen to me. It won't happen to me. How many people are still doing stuff in our society that it won't happen to me? It won't happen to me. And yet, it's still, they still get caught. All of us need to be wise, but what we do in the dark, what we do under hiding, somehow we think will not be exposed. That's just not the answer. The best thing to do is run to God for mercy for those things you've done in the dark and keep yourself in the light from that point forward. But, um, so Achan did not take God seriously. I ask us fathers, do we take God seriously as fathers ourselves? Achan did not reign in his spirit. When he had that temptation, he should have reigned in his spirit. He cared more for his desires than God's. To covet is an inordinate desire. If you desire something that you know is wrong, reign it in. Crucify yourself. Mortify those things. Achan was willing to take a chance on something that God hated and was graciously, God was gracious enough to warn about. Achan decided, I think there's a chance that I can steal 
and get away with it. Bad decision. If Achan, now think about this, if Achan would have waited just a matter of days, what would have happened? If he'd have left that spoil to God and left that alone, what would have happened in a couple days? They would have got to the next city and he would have been able to have all the spoil he wanted. Achan could not wait those few days. He could have had all the spoil in his proper time. He coveted and stole. He was a thief. He was a God robber. And by the way, he had to hide the stuff. They couldn't even use it. Where was it? Now here's what I want to bring in the ladies. Lady, in this case. Now, again, I don't know this. His wife could have been a good woman and he was a bad man and he could have damaged the whole family. He did damage them. But what if his wife had the desires for the clothing of the Babylonians? What if he said, you know what, I just really want to please my wife. What if she was like that? I don't know. But either way, he did it all in secret. His eyes had more control over him than his heart to honor God. He couldn't even use the stuff. He could have waited and enjoyed the stuff in the open. She could have dressed with those clothes. His kids could have dressed. They could have bought everything they needed with the money. But he decided to hide it. He decided to go early for this desire. What was he teaching his family? Was his fam By the way, where, were the, where was the stuff buried? In the midst of his tent. Did his family know he put it there? Think of that. They could have willingly participated in this. I don't know the answer to that. What was he teaching them by his actions? He was not teaching them good as a dad. What did Joshua do? Look at verse 22 and 23. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua, and unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Now his sin, that he did in secret, has been laid out in front of everybody. Millions. Possibly two million people. I'm not sure how many were there. Their fighting men were over 600,000. So all this is laid out in front of them, for everyone to see. Now Achan has literally become the enemy of the people. You're going to watch the people end up turning on Achan. We have seen his actions. We've seen his appraisal or assessment by God. It's evident. God is angry with what he has done. But now we see Achan's end. Look at verses 24 through 26. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. By the way, Achor means trouble. This valley was now named after him. But they did just what God said now. The nation of Israel was obedient. They took everything he had. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. I wonder if Joshua knew what his name meant or if this just came providentially. But he fulfilled his name. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from his, the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor, or Trouble, unto this day. Achan lost the things he coveted. He lost all his loved ones, his life, his honor, the respect of God. Think about this. You can actually have the respect of God. God can look at you, even though you're a sinner, God can look at you with respect. He knows your frame. He knows your dust. He knows you're not perfect. But you can live a life in such a manner where God will respect you to the best of his ability for us as sinners. But Achan lost the respect of God. How sad. How huge. You have the ability for God to esteem you with value because of how you respond to him. His, he lost the respect of his countrymen. And his example has been memorialized forever. I don't look down on Achan. By the grace of God, I haven't done what he did. I'm still capable of doing that. I'm not, I'm not looking down on this guy. I'm helping us or, or encouraging us to look at this example that God gives us. So his name has been memorialized forever. He hurt his loved ones as their husband, father, and leader. Do you literally hurt your children by the decisions you make? What if your children perish forever and ever? You're hurting them by the example you have. It's not your fault necessarily that they're not saved. That's an individual decision. But we have way more weight in our family's lives than we may think. All right? So he troubled Israel. He ended up being capitally punished, capital punishment. We must think about our actions. And the heap of stones was there to remind others. When they walked past that, memorials were big to Israel. I love memorials. If I go past something, I want to read what this memorial is about. So that was a memorial for them to remember. 
I appreciate your patience. In these last few minutes, we're going to look at the second man. I thought of doing the next man next week, but we need to see the, com the comparison. We're going to look at the second man. This man is Caleb. Who is this man? What does his name mean? I, I, knew what Caleb, I knew what Achan's name meant, trouble. I didn't know what Caleb's name meant. We'll, we'll look at that in a moment. But what does his name mean? Caleb was one of 12 men who were sent by Moses to spy out the promised land. Of the 10 spies, only he and Joshua gave her a good report of the land and believed God's promise that they would get the land. Here's his name. Caleb means to yelp like a dog, to attack. It means to be forcible and bold. Very interesting. While Achan was doing things covertly, Caleb was bold and out in the open. His name now is much more than its basic meaning. Remember when we said Achan means trouble and Achan never got past his name. He lived in that name. But Caleb has made his name so much more. When people name their kids Caleb, they're not thinking of a yelping dog. They're thinking of a bold and honorable man. So Caleb was bold and out in the open. His name now is much more than its basic meaning. He lived past the meaning of his name. So let's look at his life briefly. We're going to see first Caleb's conduct. Caleb's conduct. By his conduct, many have been called Caleb over the thousands of years since he roamed the earth. And they're still being named after him. And by the way, Achan, I don't believe, is found in uh, popular baby name books. I don't think that's the case. So let's read a few sections about him about his conduct. Go, if you would, to Numbers chapter 13. Again, I appreciate your patience, uh, but these things are important, and I hope you'll dwell on these things today, on this Father's Day. This is going to end on a good note, okay? We are going to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to abbreviate some of this for the sake of our time. Numbers chapter 13. If you're familiar with the story, um, they, there's 12 men picked out to spy out the land. Numbers chapter 13. In verse 25, it says this. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they came back from spying and they laid all the fruit out and they told him and said, We came unto the land hither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. He spoke out loud, and he got the people to be quiet. And he said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And you know the rest. They brought an evil report. They were cursed, and they spent 40 years in the wilderness. But Caleb opposed the people and stood for what God promised in front of everyone. Like Achan was hiding... Caleb filled his name. He was bold. He was an attacker for the things of God. He stood up for the things of God. In, 14, in chapter 14, when the people were murmuring and crying over the giants, calling themselves grasshoppers and not remembering God, but Caleb and Joshua did. The people blamed God, decided to return to Egypt. And here's what Caleb and Joshua did. Look at chapter 14, verses 6 through 10. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephuni, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes... They actually tore their clothes. They were in a great uh, discouragement and grieving. They tore their clothes. Verse 7, it says, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us, and their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Watch what the people did. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. So this was Caleb's conduct before God, and God noticed. God noticed the difference in Caleb's heart as Achan's. You notice both men. So that's his conduct. Let's see what God thought about it. We'll see God's commendation. 
Look at Numbers, same chapter, verses 22 through 24. Actually, we'll look at verse 21. He's talking to Moses about his anger. When God, or Moses prayed, God forgave them in verse 20. But in 20, 21 it says, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened unto my voice, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. By the way, those ten spies died of a plague coming up really fast. But watch what he says about Caleb. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, I'm sorry, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Caleb had another spirit. He followed God fully. What does God say about him? Look at Numbers chapter 32. We're working our way back towards Joshua. Numbers chapter 32. Now we're going to get God's, um, God's commendation or God's assessment of who Caleb was. So I'm telling you, God notices what's going on inside your heart. He notices who you're serving. Numbers 32 and verse 12. 32, 12. We'll, we'll actually look at 11 or 10. And the Lord's anger was kindled the same time, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham. Even 20-year-olds have to die. That's how serious this was. Which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua the son of Nun, for they have wholly Follow the Lord. So Caleb had another spirit. He followed God fully. In Deuteronomy, just a few more pages, go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. I'm going to read to you verse 30 through 36. We see God's heart in the people's mistakes. And we see God's feelings about Caleb. So what I said to you in the beginning, you can affect how God feels. We're going to see God's feelings on Caleb. All right, verse 30. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that ye went until ye came into this place. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God. The people, after all the miracles, they did not believe God was going to give them that place. In verse 33, who went in the way before you. God, he said, I went before you. I searched out a place so you can pitch your tents in, in fire by night to show you by what way you should go, and in the cloud by day. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give unto your father, say, Caleb, the son of Jephuni. He shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath holy followed the Lord. God told him, he said, wherever Caleb walked, I'm going to give it to him. And by the way, that occurred. All right? So um, what did Caleb say about himself now? Look at Joshua chapter, back in Joshua. Go back to Joshua 14. We're going to wrap up in just a few minutes. Joshua chapter 14. So we've seen... Uh, Joshua's conduct. We've seen God's commendation. We've seen what God thinks about Joshua. Here's what Joshua was able to say about himself. He's not bragging, I don't think. He's sharing the amazing things God did in his life. Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 8. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Caleb was a man's man. Caleb was out in the open. Caleb was bold. He attacked and did the things he was supposed to do. But he wholly followed the Lord. The word holy means this. Not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y. He wholly followed the Lord. That's what God said about him. Wouldn't it be amazing if you stood before God and he said, Carmen, I love you. You wholly follow me. What, what more could God say? What better thing could he say? The word holy means entirely, completely, 
perfectly, totally, in all the parts and kinds. That's what God said about Caleb. Was he perfect? No. But God himself, the creator of all the universe, the one that knows the hearts of all men, he said, Caleb, you wholly followed me. So, as I, as I think about manly men, manly men today, guess what? They're known for doing their own thing. Remember Frank Sinatra? I did it my way. That's what a man's man is considered today. But that's not what a man's is. He, as a man's man, gave his will over completely for God. He surrendered his own will for God. This was a warrior. This was a fighting man. This was a bold and forceful man. Yet he had enough tact. He had enough wisdom. He had enough godliness. He said, I'm a man, but I'm going to follow that man. I'm going to follow the Savior. And he reigned in himself, unlike Caleb. He brought his heart, his mind, his conduct under God's ways. He was surrendered, but still passionately lived out his life for God. What a father's example to his children. So, he passionately lived out his life for God. Nothing hidden, nothing covered up. He fit his name, yelping, boldly, forcibly attacking the enemies of God physically. But I want you to understand, Caleb not only fought physically those enemies... Caleb fought spiritually the enemies that would bring him down and bring his family down. God said he wholly followed the Lord. Amazing. We have enemies that are not physical maybe right now, but we have spiritual enemies that if we're not careful, they will bring us down and they will destroy our families. So, he fit his name. Think of him, a yelping, barking, attacking uh, guard dog. That, that is him, but so much more. He fought about... He fought against the things that would take him and his family down. He was an all-out man for God. People sometimes say, you're a follower, like it's a bad thing. How did that turn out for Caleb being a follower? <laughs> it didn't turn out bad. He knew surrender to the Savior would bring him success. He was a great leader because he knew how to follow his God. He listened intently to the commands of God. When God said, don't touch the cursed thing, that was not a problem for Achan. He wholly followed God from the heart. He executed God's will. That's a man. He did not care who stood in the way. He wasn't backing down or changing course. He was a bold follower. His conduct has been seen. His commendation from God. God praised his efforts. But lastly, let's see God's compensation. God's compensation. How did God pay Caleb back? The promises of God fell on both these men. Achan was accursed. Caleb received every promise that God told him. Listen to Joshua 14, verses 9 through 12. And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. In eternity, do you think Caleb will have that land? I bet you he will. Okay? He says, um, Surely it will be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And, no, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old, and yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now, for war, both to go out and to come in. He's praising God. He's not bragging. Verse 12, Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakins were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be that the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord commanded. So this is what he says about himself. He got to live. He was patient. He waited 40 years for his inheritance when Achan wouldn't wait days. Amazing. He was patient. God gave him strength to still fight. God rewarded Caleb for all of the endurance he had. God was faithful to his promise. He gave him the land that he walked on when he spied out the land. In verses 13 and 14, Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephuni, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephuni, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. In chapter 15, he gets the land, but still has to fight for it. Look at chapter 15, verse 13 and 14. And unto Caleb, the son of Jephuni, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which is in Hebron. And Caleb drove out thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. So at 85 years old, he went to battle, and he took care of business. 
So Caleb fulfills his duty. The land becomes his, and his kids inherit it as well. Caleb waited 40 years in faithful submission. Achan's kids inherited the trouble their dad caused. They died because of his trouble. Caleb's inherited life in the promised land by his wholehearted surrender, by his faithful, committed surrender to God. Our conclusion today, what kind of father will we be? What kind of father will we be? Will we trouble our families by not listening to God's warnings in these last days? Will we lead them into their own trouble? Will we lead our children into trouble by our decisions? Or will we lead them into a manly faith, living out in the open, fully surrendered to God's ways, wholly following God's path, not seeking our own way? What will be our choice today? God does see where our allegiance lies. Every one of you right now, if God were to ask, or if God were to expose you, He will show you where your allegiance lies. May we choose wisely. Those that come after us, those that are around us will be affected. 